Esteemed laureates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as the director of the University of Bergen, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this award ceremony of the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klimt Prize. Academic prizes and awards contribute to the recognition of outstanding scholarly achievements. And today we celebrate first and foremost the laureates. But it is also an occasion to celebrate academic excellence in the humanities, social sciences, law and theology, and to highlight the importance of research in these fields. The list of academic prizes and awards within the natural sciences, technology and medicine have grown over the last years. Far fewer have been established to acknowledge the unique accomplishments within the humanities, social sciences, law and theology. So when the Norwegian parliament established the prize in 2003, the goal was to elevate the status of these academic fields. And since then it has been the privilege of our university to be associated with these highly recognized prizes. This year's award ceremony celebrates not only the 2021 laureates, but also last year's laureates, given that the Holberg Week and the award ceremony in 2020 was affected by the pandemic. This celebration of all the four laureates show the broad appeal relevance and importance of the disciplines elevated by the Holberg and Nils Klim Prize. Today's laureates, Griselda Pollack, Marta C. Nussbaum, Fredrik Paulsen and Daria Gritsenko, all exhibit some very significant academic qualities and virtues in their respective work to understand human thought, art and culture and in their exploration of social and political development, be they in national or a global context. Through their work and discoveries, they question and challenge established norms and the way we think about life. In this respect, the laureates are truly inspirational, not only by showing that research in these areas are impo is important, but they also show how their academic labors have a direct impact on people's lives. Ever since the Norwegian Parliament established the prize in 2003, the Holberg Prize has contributed to the recognition of outstanding scholarly achievements. And today's laureates are no exception. And it is a privilege and an honor for our university to be associated with them. So, whether you are with us physically or digitally, I welcome you all again to this award ceremony. Celebrating last year's and this year's laureates of the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize. And now, I thank you for your attention and I give the floor to the chair of the Holberg Board, Professor Kjersti Flöttum. Well. <clears throat> Esteemed laureates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this award ceremony for the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize. Today, we are pleased to honor and celebrate the 2020 and the 2021 laureates, Griselda Pollock, Marta Carter Nussbaum, Fredrik Paulsen, and Daria Grisenko. My name is Kjersti Flöttum, and as chair of the Holberg Board, it's my great privilege to guide you through this award ceremony which will take us to Norwegian ambassadors' residences in London, in Copenhagen and Helsinki, as well as to the University of Chicago, where the laureates will receive their respective prizes. And from here, 
uh, the University of Aula in Bergen, the home of the Holberg Prize, we are gathered to celebrate these outstanding laureates who have all made groundbreaking contributions to research in the academic fields covered by the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize. The Holberg Prize was established by the Norwegian Parliament in 2003, and the intention of the founders was to raise the status of research in the humanities, social sciences, law, and theology. The Holberg Prize awards two prizes. It is the Holberg Prize itself, which is awarded to renowned international scholars across the world, and the Nils Klim Prize, which is awarded to young researchers from the Nordic countries. Now, the Holberg Prize is named after Ludwig Holberg, who was born in Bergen in 1684 and became professor at the University of Copenhagen in several of the fields that are covered by the prize, including metaphysics and logic, Latin, rhetoric, and history. Holberg played an important role in bringing the Enlightenment to Nordic countries, and he's well known as a playwright, above all for his, com for his comedies and satirical works. The Holberg Prize is awarded annually to a scholar who has had a decisive influence on international research. The prize is worth 6 million Norwegian kroner, equivalent to approximately 720,000 US dollars or 590,000 euros. And the selection of the laureate is based on nominations of candidates. University professors and scholars at other research institutions, including academies, are entitled to nominate candidates for the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize. Each year, around 100 candidates are nominated for the Holberg Prize. And they are assessed by the Holberg Committee, which consists of five internationally renowned scholars in the fields covered by the prize. The Holberg Committee then recommends a candidate to the board who makes the final decision. And the same procedure with the, with the Nils Klim Prize committees is followed for the Nils Klim Prize. So now, let me call on the Norwegian ambassador to the United Kingdom, Wegger Christian Strömmen, who will confer the 2020 Holberg Prize on Professor Griselda Pollock at the Ambassador's residence in London. On behalf of the Ministry of Education and Research, the University of Bergen, and on the recommendation of the Holberg Committee, the board of the Holberg Prize had, has decided that the 2020 Holberg Prize goes to Professor Griselda Pollock. Griselda Pollock is Professor of Social and Critical Histories of Art and Director of the Center for Cultural Analysis, Theory and History at the University of Leeds. She is a transdisciplinary scholar who works with cultural analysis of modernity and its traumas. Professor Pollock has is a dedicated feminist art historian who critically examines the discipline of art history with the assistance of a wide range of cultural theory and multiple perspectives. Born in South Africa, where she spent critical years of her childhood, she also grew up in Francophone and English Canada before migrating to Britain, where she completed her education. She studied modern history at the University of Oxford and did an MA and PhD in History of Art at the Cordell Institute of Art, University of London. She has taught at the universities of Reading, Manchester, and Leeds, where she has devoted 43 years of her active and diverse teaching career, teaching art history, cultural studies, fine art, and feminist theory. 
1990, she became Professor of Social and Critical Histories of Art, stating with the title her commitment to radical challenge to the discipline and to its pluralization. She co-founded an, an interdisciplinary center for cultural studies in 1985, a center for Jewish studies in 1995, focusing on visualities. And she's the founding director of the Trans, uh, Transdisciplinary Center for Cultural Analysis, Theory and History. In their citation, the Holber Committee writes, and I quote, Professor Griselda Pollock is the foremost feminist art historian working in the world today. Since the 1970s, Pollock has been teaching and publishing in a field in which she is not only a renowned authority, but which she also helped create. In addition, she has exercised a profound influence on the development of feminist cinema studies, and she continues to be an inspirational figure, both inside and outside of the academy. Academy. Pollock's first major scholarly contribution, Old Mistresses, Women, Art and Ideology from 1981, was a radical critique of art historical practice, the art canon and art museum curation. And it has become a classic work of feminist art history that remains fresh today. The pioneering spirit that informs Old Mistresses is, is found in Pollock's other publications on art and art, artists, starting from her early reviews in the feminist journal Sperib in the 1970s to monographs on such figures as Van Gogh, Mary Cassatt, and Charlotte Solomon. Moreover, her foundational articles and catalog essays on artists such as Eva Hesse, Louise Boudoise, and Georgia O'Keeffe have helped transform the art historical canon from teaching and research throughout the world. A defining feature of her work is that she combines the expertise of traditional art, historical scholarship, with cutting edge theoretical sophistication. She has also been influential in film and trauma studies. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, her work on feminist film theory, notably her screen article on Hollywood melodrama, became a cornerstone in the developing field of cinema studies. More recently, the book Concentrationary Cinema has influenced a whole school of subsequent thinking. Her magisterial monograph, Charlotte Solomon and the Theatre of Memory, brings this field together with her feminist work, offering a groundbreaking analysis of the series of paintings produced by a young Jewish woman who subsequently died in Auschwitz. Over a career in which she has produced more than 25 books and at least 200 articles and essays, essays, Grisella Pollock has always upheld the highest levels of scholarship while challenging received wisdom and institutional hierarchies of thought and value. For this, she has been a beacon for, ge for generations of art and cultural historians." End of quote. I now ask Professor Griselda Pollock to join the podium with me to receive the 2020 Holger Prize. Your Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, and our absent friends, the Holberg Committee, colleagues all around the world and anyone's listening, and of course the representative of my family, Hester Bloom, who stands as part of my constant support network. Thank you very much indeed for this honor 
to receive the prize from you at the Norwegian Embassy today in this chilly moment of Britain. But the warmth of my welcome here is immediate and I thank you for that. Now it's difficult to convey the emotions aroused by an email that popped up in February 2020 to call, inviting me to call back the chair of the Holberg Committee. Shock that such a thing could happen. Delirious delight that such peer recognition for my tiny, tiny corner of the field selected for this prize, namely art history, could take place. Disbelief and amazement that I might take my place amongst the stellar list of the previous laureates, most of whom are the intellectual gods and goddesses of my academic universe. I also felt the honor of a recognition for the discipline in which I've worked for half, half a century. For so often as I have traveled around the world to give lectures, people have asked me what I do. The word art historian prompts a second question. What exactly is an art historian? I also feel the honor as a citation for this prize defines me as a feminist art historian. I feel the honor on behalf of the historical event of which I am a part, what I call post-1968 feminism. Not only a worldwide and very successful social movement of women that actively campaigns for justice, safely, safety, health, security, citizenship, and above all, the humanity of women, feminism of the later 20th century engendered an intellectual and cultural revolution that is unique in its contribution to the millennia-long struggle against patriarchy. To be awarded a prize of this dimension for a, as a contributor to and even as a founding direct, uh, thinker within the feminist cultural revolution is profound and deeply moving. I thank the committee and those who took the time to propose and recommend my work as deeply as it is possible to do so. I not only work as a feminist art historian, but as a cultural analyst. This expresses an affiliation to the concept of Kulturwissenschaft, kind of cultural studies advanced by the um, German Jewish art historian Abi Warburg to contest a certain kind of aestheticizing art history. Warburg's contribution was to suggest that the image is a carrier and transmitter of psychologically deep, if not archaic, cultural memory that is passed down through gestures and rituals that carry affect that then become encoded like a little system by the image. As has already been said, this engagement was long preceded by my involvement with film studies that had been reshaped by both uh, semiotics and theories of uh, semi-ideology, uh, as well as by its feminist dimension, psychoanalysis. And then I've been involved in cultural studies founding the center at Leeds with the sociologist Janet Wolfe. Approaching the histories of art that I pluralize to challenge the limit limitations of what is presented as a canon canonical all-male Euro-centered story of art, I challenge them from these expanded and multiple perspectives. And this was only made more acute in terms of the significance of art history itself as a site of all of the above, of ideology, of semiotics, of the life of the psyche and the image. Yet I have to say that although I've been extremely supported by many co-thinkers in my discipline, I feel a little bit marginalized in my own academic community, particularly at the public facing dimension of the museum, the exhibition, and notably the art market. A quietly personal feminist stamp, a stance might be acceptable, even if it's not no longer respectable or even interesting, but a relentlessly feminist theoretical interrogation and denunciation of power systems of abuse and violation in the world inscribed in and by means of art and culture has become irritating at worst and intellectually demodé at its tedious best. You see, art is not expected to be the site of agonism, conflict, or violence. Yet, in fact, everything we teach when we teach the history of art links art making and images to power, to institutions such as religion and its socially sanctioned morality and theologies, to monarchy, to property, to law, to class formations, to empire, and to the management of bodies and sexualities and the Foucauldian and Freudian senses, as well as to the shaping of imaginations and identities, and finally to language itself. 
Recently, more urgent conflicts like Black Lives Matter, planetary disaster, gender transitioning, let alone a global pandemic and other long-standing energy uh, agonies of a world Im that impoverishes so many, these have attracted media attention and redirected academic fashion away from feminism. Young women have been misinformed as to what feminism is and encouraged not to identify with it. Now, my sense of being at the heart of a historic feminist project uh, as a result of the tolerated but deeply sus at the, at, the, at the tolerated but deeply suspect margins of my own discipline is also the product of intellectual hybridity that some might consider treachery. Many of the Holberg laureates, from its first Julia Kristeva to its most recent before me, Paul Gilroy, have been my inspirations and guides in negotiating complex entanglements of language, subjectivity, power, fantasy, and desire, meaning the symbolic in ethics, none of which are central to the historical disciplines under which art history traditionally sits. <laughs> Indeed, I would even dare to say that my published writings have been treated as a conceptually alien invasion into the glorious sphere of art and its uplifting histories. I've apparently imported foreign, again another uh, indicative term, modes of thinking into this pure and beautiful domain of art through what I joyfully embrace as transdisciplinary encounters of many kinds. Note the Spielberg reference. I travel freely across sociology, including Marxism, psychology, including psychoanalysis, theology, both Judaic and Christian, film, literary, political, and even legal theory, as well as philosophy, all sorts. My work crosses the very categories of this prize, entangling the social sciences and the humanities with the arts in ways uncommon in, and at times considered deleterious to, the arts, and disrespectful of disciplinary specificities. Now, while race and class were politicized in the 18th and 19th century anti-liberation theories and Marxism, the originality of international feminism after 1968 lay in its redefinitions of both gender and sexual difference as radicalizing terms of struggle and theoretical concepts that enabled us to track not only the asymmetrical hierarchies of the social relation of gender, but also the, um, the metaphors of power and powerlessness that are encoded in the imaginary associated with masculine and feminine. To discern, critique, deconstruct, transform, and challenge the systems and relations of power that are embedded in thought systems, language, and socio uh, sociological as well as psychosexual formations of subjectivity and are disseminated in artistic processes and cultural forms, has necessitated the creation of new vocabularies and raised the dreaded specter, theory, capital T. The effect of linguistic theoretical innovation has been alienating in the demands it makes for transdisciplinarity and its complexity. And this complexity corresponds to the temporal longevity and cultural depth of the issues we as feminists are seeking to think through. What we gain with this theoretical vocabulary is the power to pierce the opacity of normalized, sedimented, patriarchal, heterocratic, phallocentric, and colonial systems that had hitherto been unnamed and hence impossible to contest. The final novelty of this struggle, at once to acknowledge gender and sexual difference and to trace their entanglements and reconfigurations with race, class, sexuality, and geopolitical, geoethnic dissymmetries in a globalizing world, these have come to take place both inside the university and, as it were, in the sphere of created culture, understood not only anthropologically as what we do and what we believe, but as aesthetically as art, namely how we represent the world, and how um, it is, the world is constituted, constituted by how we think and act and believe in terms of both power and imagery, possibility and transformation. I am the first art historian to be honored with this prize, and this is very humbling in a still tiny discipline that nonetheless has a wide public reach. The non-specialist public receives the fruits of art historical work through museums, blockbuster exhibitions, biopics of great artists, cultural highlights on arts TV, in cinema, and also when the news reports another astronomical price paid for an old white master. 
Museums are increasingly leisure and cultural destinations, key sites for tourist economies of major cities, or maybe just safe places to have your first date. Some of us in art history are deeply anxious about this slippage of a once critical historical philosophical discipline into one that services entertainment and cultural consumption in a liquid modern version of what the Germans called Bildung. Art is now part of a capitalist economy of consumption and to be so its presentation must be shorn of complexity, difficulty and certainly of ugly words such as class, race, gender, power, exploitation and oppression, none of which can be part of the promotional script for a blockbuster exhibition for leisure consumption and for the acquisition of cultural and now in financialized times real capital. In my own work, I meet the obligations of post-colonial queer international and social histories of feminist questioning. These run up against institutional indifference, they don't believe there is such a problem, institutional refusal to confront or acknowledge the agonies and creativities that result from difference, and institutional silence in face of the challenges to the museum for their failure to collect, curate, exhibit, and educate us for societies rich in diversity and for a world of entangled hurts and brilliant creativity. When I was interviewed for the award in 2020, I was introduced as someone who had rediscovered forgotten women artists, and then asked, hopefully, has it got better? Batting away the wicked untruths hidden in the notion of words rediscover and forgotten, the constant and ubiquitous creativity in women has been not forgotten but systematically absented, I had to tell my interviewers that it had not got any better. In 2019, a survey of auction sales of contemporary art revealed that women artists constituted just 2% of the sales, and of that 2%, 47% relate to just five women. These are shocking figures that reveal not only through the outrageous financial imbalance or misevaluation, but also reflect the fact that the art market today exposes how we undervalue women's creativity in all its global diversity, and this in turn reflects the true picture of the jeopardized statement status of women in the world today. Art history is, however, an important and critical arena because images matter, and this, this is the discipline which has considered the nature of the image, both past and present. If art history just tells the stories of great white men, we will never learn to think with art, to ask what images do when they're physically made, critically and inventively enacted, located in differentially embodied creators, for art making is a critical index of our world and who and what we are collectively. Rather than ask what images of, of, I ask what images do, what art does, but neither can question can be answered into disciplinary isolation. I have to say I was precipitated as much into this way of thinking by, in fact, working with contemporary artists, creating at the 1970s and onwards in the sphere of uh, conceptual art for which there was not a paradigm or model. I had to learn to puzzle out what this new kind of work was doing by asking, what am I seeing? What is it doing? How is it doing that? What meanings is it producing or shifting or deconstruction? These enabled me to unlock complex artworks that offered a method of asking questions that could equally transform the work of the great queer Catholic Michelangelo as the Catalan, not the Catalan, the Malagan Picasso in the 20th century. To revision art history equipped with the resources of the studies movements and expanded theoretical tre treasury, feminist consciousness and the lessons that I could learn from living amongst contemporary artists, especially those women who would find their careers erased even as they lived side by side with the curators and art historians. This has been an exhilarating and entirely addictive life's work. But the prize for this, and I'm almost finishing, for this contribution to the foundation of feminist studies can only be received by me on behalf of an international community of thinkers and artists, scholars and theorists who have enacted this feminist cultural revolution since 1968, touching and challenging every discipline from genetics to political theory, quantum physics to art history, and delivering a sustained assault on an unjust, and as we have shown, a dangerous society and that we identify its hegemonic phallocentric order. 
So I accept this prize joyfully as part of the feminist community in struggle with the major challenges of world historical time, what Julia Kristeva, a former laureate, terms monumental time. And as the rain begins to fall upon us in London, I simply wish to say that I am delighted to be here on Norwegian territory to receive the prize to enable me to the further, uh, furtherance of post-colonial queer social international feminist interventions in arts histories and the creative intellectual struggle through which I can also foster creativity in the arts. I thank once again the people and government of Norway, the University of, Bil of Bergen, the Committee of the Holberg Prize for being the beacon of hope, enlightenment, generosity and courage through this prize. I am not worthy but deeply, deeply honoured to accept it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we extend our sincere congratulations to you, Griselda Pollock. And without further ado, let me call on the Norwegian Consul General in New York, Harriet Elisabeth Berg, to confer the 2021 Holberg Prize on Professor Marta Carter Nussbaum at the University of Chicago. On behalf of the Ministry of Education and Research and the University of Bergen, and on the recommendation of the Holberg Committee, the board of the Holberg Prize has decided that this year's Holberg Prize goes to Professor Martha C. Nussbaum. Martha C. Nussbaum is the Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago, with a joint appointment in the Law School and Philosophy Department. Her research interests include ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, political philosophy, philosophy of literature, feminism, music and ethics, as well as animal rights. Professor Nussbaum her, uh, received her PhD from Harvard in 1975. She has taught at Harvard University, Brown University, and Oxford University. To date, Nussbaum has written 27 books and three are in progress. In addition, she has published about 500 articles and edited 26 books. Her books have been translated into two dozen languages. Nussbaum's numerous awards include the Bergrun Prize in Philosophy and Culture in 2018 and the Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy in 2016. Nussbaum has received honorary degrees from over 60 colleges and universities in the US, Canada, Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. She is an academician in the Academy of Finland, a fellow of the British Academy, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's also a member of the American Philosophical Society, where she was president of the Central Division from 1999 to 2000. In her their citation, the Holberg Committee writes, Martha C. Nussbaum's work combines a rigorous training in classics with a broad engagement with many themes and schools in the contemporary humanities and social sciences. Her writing is always scrupulous about arguments, perceptive about human emotions and vulnerability, and attentive to the realities of human situations, social interactions, and the many forms of dependence and interdependence that can rise within them. Professor Nussbaum's influence and impact extend well beyond her own discipline, and she has demonstrated an exceptional commitment to the task of distributing the benefits of academic knowledge to a wider public. Her earliest work concentrated on matters of ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and her 1978 edition and commentary on Aristoteles' De Motu Animalium remains a seminal work on Aristotelian philosophy of mind and nature. In The Fragility of Goodness in 1986 and The Therapy of Desire in 1994, Nussbaum drew on the stoic notion of the cognitive nature of emotions and developed her interest in how philosophy and literature might together eliminate foundational aspects of a good human life. 
Her later work has applied this method to explorations of the emotions in human life. These works include Upheavals of Thought from 2001, From Disgust to Humanity, 2010, Political Emotions in 2013, and Anger and Forgiveness in 2016. Martha Sinusbaum has also made important contributions to the humanities more broadly in confronting modern political problems and questions of well-being. Most remarkable is her development of the capabilities approach, an important method for conceptualizing human well-being, now widely used in the measurement of poverty, development, social exclusion and inclusion, and social equality and inequality more broadly conceived. The range of her scholarly contributions is extensive, engaging with debates in feminist philosophy, disability studies, law, gender studies, animal rights, and the philosophy of cosmopolitanism. In all of these areas, she has been distinctive, passionate, powerful, and a much needed voice. Truly a public philosopher, her work has reached wide audiences across the world, as well as influenced many areas of knowledge. Nussbaum is one of the world's leading intellectuals and a prominent advocate for the humanities and for the value of reason and compassion in public affairs. While Nussbaum's eminence in her fields of academic endeavor is unquestionable, what is particularly admirable is her dedication to the task of putting her knowledge to work towards making a real and lasting difference to people across the world. And this is what the committee says. For these reasons and many more, Martha C. Nussbaum is a highly worthy recipient of the 2021 Holberg Prize. So now I ask Martha C. Nussbaum to join uh, me on the podium to receive the 2021 Holberg Prize. Congratulations. I'm immensely grateful to the government of Norway for the honor of this prize. It's wonderful that two representatives of that government are present here, Consul General Harriet Berg from New York and Honorary Consul Susan Meyer from Chicago. And it's very fitting, though originally unintended, that this ceremony is taking place on the campus of the University of Chicago, where I found a happy home since 1995. I couldn't do my work without this great university both its law school and its philosophy department, which have created an ideal environment for work and teaching. If I singled out all the individuals I would actually like to thank, starting as I'd have to with my family and my elementary and high school teachers, this speech would go on and on and I would be played off the stage like those self-indulgent speakers at the Academy Award pre presentations. So I'll just stick to this university. I want to thank the three deans who are present here. Dean Tom Miles of the law school, who by the way is a marvelous actor. He alluded to that, so I will also allude to it. <clears throat> Dean Ann Robertson of the Humanities Division and Dean David Nirenberg of the Divinity School. Above all though, <clears throat> my life is spent in the philosophy department whose outstanding chair, Michael Kramer, is unfortunately not able to be here today where over the years I've worked with such marvelous graduate students who tell me exactly where I'm wrong and who do new creative work that inspires me, and in the law school where the students are terrific and often mingle valuably in classes and seminars with the philosophy graduate students, since unlike law students in most countries, they have a liberal arts background before starting law and are comparable to our best PhD students. I want particularly to mention the rich faculty culture of the law school, where so many of my manuscripts have been poked and prodded by critical questions in the Socratic spirit. People are so generous, giving their time to others. I remember one Friday afternoon when I finished a draft of a lecture I'd been working on for a long time, 
and I was pretty nervous about the occasion and the lecture, sending it to six of my law colleagues that afternoon. And by Monday, I had received immensely helpful written comments from all six. I hope I match that in my conduct, but it's a daunting standard to live up to. If there's just one individual whom I must thank by name, it is my frequent co-author, Saul Levmore, who unfortunately is unable to be with us today. He never lets me become complacent. He always tells me that I'm wrong and why. And I hope that, rather like those Roman friends, Cicero and Atticus, our exchanges and even jokes improve both our insights into the highly relevant theme of aging on which we co-authored a book in 2017, but also improve the actual experience of aging. My career has focused on two areas, normative theorizing about justice and investigation of the nature and role of the emotions. Increasingly, I've been bringing the two together and thinking of the role emotions play in moving us toward or, as the case may be, away from a just and decent society. All of this work has been continually nourished by my long study of the history of Greek and Roman philosophy, very much including the philosophical elements of literature, of music too, but there's no time to say more about that today. In the process, I've also made an attempt to address a wider public and to play the role of what people sometimes call a public philosopher, something that's very difficult to do in this country. But I've tried to do it always in a way that upholds philosophical standards and honors the work of other thinkers past and present. The Holberg Prize is that rare prize that singles out the humanities so often ignored in our public culture and so much in need of more support today. Our society, like Norway, has come through a great and terrible trauma. We're starting to come out the other side of that darkness as the Mozart aria I've chosen, Un Moto di Gioia, depicts. And I want to thank Patrice Michaels, not only a wonderful artist, but also a great teacher of struggling voice students, including me, for being here to, to sing it. Prominent in our shared experience in this dark time have been many emotions that have been both personal and part of our shared public life, fear, grief, and all too often, anger. Because I think anger is especially dangerous and destructive in our political life, let me dwell for a moment on that emotion, showing how a philosophical approach to the emotion of anger and the fear that so often underlies it can help us come to grips with the challenges of our political moment, a theme I've written about in my books, Anger and Forgiveness and the Monarchy of Fear. So this is only a tiny sketch of a much fuller argument. Let me start with a literary depiction of retributive anger, the final play of the Oresteia of Aeschylus. As the play opens, and we, we actually did perform this at the law school, we see a group of ugly creatures, half human, half beast, crouching on the ground. These are the Furies, goddesses who embody the human desire for retributive payback. As Aeschylus describes them, they're black, hideous. Their eyes drip a foul liquid. They even are said by the god Apollo, who was Tom Miles over there, to vomit up clots of blood that they've ingested from their prey. Their only words at first are a predator's hunting cry. Get him, get him, get him. I see Emily Buss, one of those furies in front of me, rather daunting sight. But by the end of the play, they've been transformed. They have not simply accepted the constraints of the rule of law, joining the new democracy. They've also, and most important of all, given up the retributive part of their anger. They now look forward and not back. They vigilantly protect citizens from crime, but for the sake of future welfare, not for the sake of payback. To go further, however, we need a philosophical analysis. And in the Western tradition, the definition of anger that influences all subsequent thinkers is Aristotle's. 
It's actually quite similar to definitions in Indian philosophy. The reason why I've included an expert in those traditions in our upcoming Holberg Symposium. Aristotle says that anger is a painful response to a significant damage, a damage done to something or someone that the angry person cares a lot about, and a damage that the person believes to have been wrongfully inflicted, not just accidental. So far, so uncontroversial, and anger so defined, seems not necessarily bad or destructive, but an ingredient of good, a good society's confrontation with wrongdoing. But then the furies enter. Aristotle claims that a wish for retributive payback, some sort of pain for pain, is an essential part of anger as commonly experienced. This needs a long discussion, but if we cut to the chase, I think Aristotle is basically correct. When we're angry, we all too often do want the wrongdoer to suffer, if only through punishment or even divine intervention. Or even more subtly, we find ourselves wishing that the person who wronged us will simply have a very bad life in the future, that the second marriage of your betraying spouse is a dismal failure. But the idea of retributive payback, though ubiquitous and deeply human, is empty and quite unhelpful if what we want is to change the future, which is the only thing we can change. Capital punishment does not bring back the life that was lost, although many survivors of murdered loved ones become obsessed with it as if it does some real good. Punitive litigation does not make a new future after a broken marriage and so on. Now, I actually had a different view about anger until about 2015, but I changed my mind as a result of critical and self-critical reflection. It's surprisingly delightful to change one's mind. We, we should all do a lot more of it, I think. <laughs> so in my recent work, I then investigated the futility of anger at greater length and show how this kind of empty thinking is often closely linked to fear and insecurity, to an underlying sense of powerlessness that reaches back to infantile experience, but that is exacerbated in times of personal or social unrest. Feeling powerless, we want control in an uncertain world, and anger gives us the illusion of control. Inflicting pain on someone feels powerful and distracts us from the task of making a productive life. In politics, this is especially true. Our nation right now, in the wake of COVID, has many real political and economic problems to solve. Economic uncertainties, the claims of immigrants and asylum seekers, the just demands of long marginalized people and groups. It's easy and human to feel helpless in the face of such problems. How easy, then, to turn to anger and scapegoating, imagining that inflicting pain on our opponents will fix the problem. We're consequently seeing these days a veritable epidemic of anger on airplanes, at sporting events, and the far more sinister instances of racial and anti-Semitic hate crimes, not to mention the recent assault on our nation's capital, a hideous explosion of retributive fantasy. And note that this way of reacting is bad whether the opponent has actually wronged you or not. Even real wrongs need to be addressed in a constructive and cooperative spirit, not in the spirit of those furies. But my Aristotelian analysis also shows us where progress can be made. There is a conceptual separation between protest and payback. We can have outrage at wrongdoing and commit ourselves to correcting it without doing so in a backward-looking retributive spirit. There's a type of anger, which I call transition anger, that keeps outrage at wrongdoing, but makes the transition turning to face forward, dropping payback in favor of making a better future. That's what happened to those furies in the play. To use the words of Martin Luther King, Jr., who reflected profoundly about anger almost 2,500 years after Aeschylus, the anger of those furies has been purified. That's what King said had to happen 
with the anger of Americans, including those in his movement. They had to give up the retributive part of their anger, which is, to use his words, confused and not radical, while keeping a future-directed outrage at wrongdoing and a truly radical commitment to pursue future justice constructively with hope and faith in the future and a love of human beings, even one's enemies. Philosophical analysis animated by literary imagination does not solve our problems. For that, we need sound economic planning, historical and scientific knowledge, psychology and psychotherapy, and multidisciplinary cooperations of many sorts. But philosophy can help us understand ourselves and see where the problems lie. And it can also help us identify some not very productive ways to respond to them. In its methods, philosophy also embodies a part of the solution, a decent, respectful, rational, and imaginatively engaged way of relating to other people. In these two related ways, philosophy contributes to the task that is always ahead of us, in Aeschylus' time and in our own, since we always must face forward wherever we are, of building a constructive, loving, and non-retributive society that doesn't play childish payback games, but genuinely pursues human welfare. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we extend our warmest congratulations to you, Marta C. Nussbaum. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce the Norwegian classical pianist, Håvard Gimse, who has received a number of prestigious prizes. He is known for his expansive repertoire and is greatly noted for his work as a recitalist and chamber musician. In addition, he is considered to be one of the Nordic region's most influential and significant recording artists. And now, in his first set, Håvard Gimse will perform the following piece, Fantasy Impromptu, Opus 66, by Fredrik Chopin. Please, Håvard Gimse.
thank you for this wonderful music, Ola Gimsa. And now we proceed to the two laureates of the Nils Klim Prize. One of the main ambitions of the Holberg Prize is to inspire and engage young scholars and to promote dialogue across different generations of researchers. The Nils Klim Prize, awarded to young scholars from the Nordic countries, is named after Ludwig Holberg's young hero in his novel Nils Klim's Underground Travels from 1741. The prize is worth 500,000 Norwegian kroner or approximately 50,000 euros. And now I have the pleasure of calling upon the Norwegian ambassador to Denmark, Eud Kolberg, who will now confer the 2020 Nils Klim Prize on Dr. Fredrik Paulsen at the ambassador's residence in Copenhagen. On behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research, the University of Bergen, and on the recommendation of the Nils Klim Committee, the board of the Holberg Prize has decided that the 2020 Nils Klim Prize be awarded to Dr. Frederik Poulsen. Frederik Poulsen, born 1984, is assistant professor of Old Testament at the Faculty of Theology, University of Copenhagen. His current research project, Stories in a Strange Land, is supported by a grant from the Carlsberg Foundation. In 2014, Paulsen received his PhD degree at the University of Copenhagen. In 2019, he obtained the title of Dr. Theol at the same university for his dissertation on exile in the Book of Yesaya. He has worked as a visiting researcher at the University of Oxford, Jerusalem University, University of Bonn and at Yale University. Paulson's research interests include exile and diaspora in the Bible, Old Testament prophecy, biblical theology and reception history. In addition to a number of articles, he is the author of three research monographs, God, His Servant and the Nations in Yesaya from 2014, representing Zion, Judgment and Salvation in the Old Testament 2015, and The Black Hole in Yesaya, A Study of Exile as a Literary Theme 2019. In their citation, the Niels Kleem Committee writes, his work is characterized by an innovative combination of historical, critical and literary methodologies that have enabled him to cast new light on these ancient texts. His second doctoral thesis, The Black Hole in Yesaya, a study of exile as a literary theme, challenges the notion that Zion Jerusalem is the main issue in Yesaya. Instead, Paulson argues that exile serves as its dark counterpoint. By focusing on exile and diaspora, which involve profound experiences of alienation and suffering, Paulson creates a link between ancient history and current issues of identity and belonging. Due to the depth and excellence of his work, Paulson has been awarded a number of prestigious grants and fellowships. His classical scholarly expertise and his creative approaches to Old Testament studies have already earned him a solid position in biblical studies. I am honored and pleased to ask Frederick Paulson to receive the 2020 Nils Klim Prize. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Should we open it? Royal Ambassador, esteemed colleagues, family and friends. It is a great honor to be the recipient of the Nils Klim Prize 2020. I am truly grateful to the Holberg Board for awarding me this prestigious prize, to the Holberg Committee for its recommendation, to those who nominated me, and to Ambassador Ort Kolberg and the Royal 
Norwegian Embassy in Denmark for hosting today's ceremony. It is a great honor, almost like a dream. I would never have dreamed about a day like this when I was first drawn into the study of the Bible. My early academic achievements were certainly stimulated when I, as a young student of theology, lived at Ludwig Holberg's old college in Copenhagen, Borg's Collegium. Mm -hmm. yes. Ever since, I have been excited by studying the Old Testament, its literature, poetic images, and theological ideas. Dreams drive us. Recently, I read the stories about Nils Klim together with our oldest child. It is an entertaining travel narrative. A young theologian travels through several worlds under the ground. Like a researcher, he meticulously studies the very different ways people live in all these, in each world, their morality, religion, and politics. Traveling through all these worlds together with Nils Klim is fascinating, not least in these months where most of us dream about being able to travel in our own world again. Dreams drive us, but dreams also occur when we sleep, involuntarily. Dreaming at night seems to help us to store memories or sort through complicated thoughts and feelings. Yet dreams at night may also contain signs or predictions about future events. In the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, we encounter a young man, Joseph. He has big dreams about future influence and success. People from all nations shall bow down to him and receive help from him. However, his youth dreams are not popular among those who are close to him. His brothers become jealous and angry, and his father rebukes him. But Joseph continues to dream, and the dreams drive him through deportation, through trials, through sufferings. The dreams drive him towards their fulfillment, towards life and wisdom. Why do we dream? Why should we dream? And why do we keep dreaming, although dreams are often not fulfilled? Because in dreams, there is life. If we stop dreaming, we will stop living. We must have big dreams in politics, in art, in research, in our lives. If we stop dreaming, we will never wake up in the baron's bed. Am I dreaming or am I awake? As the poor man Jeppe states in Ludwig Holbert's famous play. So keep on dreaming. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations to you, Fredrik Paulsen. And to confer the 2021 Nils Klim Prize on Dr. Daria Grisenko, I will now call on the Norwegian ambassador to Finland, Dag Stangnes, at the ambassador's residence in Helsinki. On behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research, the University of Bergen, and on the recommendation of the Nils Klim Committee, the board of the Holberg Prize has decided that this year's Nils Klim Prize be awarded to Dr. Daria Glitschenko. Dr. Daria Glitschenko, born 1986, is assistant professor in Russian and Eurasian studies at the University of Helsinki, where she is also affiliated with the Alexandri Institute and the Helsinki Institute of Sustainable Science. She holds a PhD in social sciences from 2014 
and achieved the title of docent in an environmental policy in 2018, both from the University of Helsinki. Dr. Glitschenko has been visiting scholar in Tromsø, Sapporo, Exeter, and Las Palmas. In 2018 and 2019, she was a fellow of the prestigious Fulbright Arctic Initiative and a visiting scholar at the George Washington University in the USA, investigating pathways of renewable energy development in the Russian Arctic. Dr. Grichenko's research is in the field of public policy and governance, with a particular focus on the dynamics between state and non-state actors in response to the changing natural and technological environments. Her work appeared in renowned academic journals, including Energy Policy, Energy Research and Social Science, Elementa, Policy Studies Journal, and Regulation and Governance. In 2017, Dr. Grichenko co-founded Digital Russia Studies, a scholarly network of exploring new ways for combining data science and social sciences in area studies. This initiative resulted in the publication of the multidisciplinary Palgrave Handbook of Digital Russia Studies in 2021. This is a volume that reflects how digital is simultaneously changing Russia and the research methods scholars use to study Russia and offers practical methodological guidance. In their citation, the Nils Klim Committee writes, quote, Dr. Grichenko's versatile background has earned her an outstanding international profile as a researcher despite her young age. Throughout her career, she has specialized in Arctic studies, maritime transportation, energy, and sustainability. All of her research is highly relevant in regard to current global issues of political governance and environmental concerns. Her ambitious and creative approach to these issues attests to her courage as a researcher, combining digitalization and social and environmental analysis of potentially volatile political questions." Unquote. I now ask Dr. Daria Grichenko to join me to receive the 2021 Nils Klim Prize. Congratulations. Congratulations. Your Excellency, Ambassador Dag Stagnes, the Holbeck Board and Nils Klim Comedy, dear colleagues and friends. This is a great honor and privilege to be here today, joining the ranks of Niels Klim laureates as the recipient of the 2021 Niels Klim Prize. As previous laureates referred to the Niels Klim novel in their acceptance speech, I will gladly follow this tradition as it highlights how multifaceted and witty is the narrative created by Ludwig Holberg. During his adventures in the subterranean world, Niels Klim reads a travel diary of one of the subterranean citizens who has been to Europe. It says that in Europe one can find learned people of different types – philosophers, poets, grammarians, scientists, metaphysicians, and so on. It goes on explaining that, I quote, a scientist is someone who examines the innards of the earth, the nature of bipeds and quadrupeds, reptiles and insects, who knows all things apart from himself while a metaphysician is a sort of a philosopher, partly visionary and partly skeptical, who sees what is concealed from all others, yet cannot discern what lies directly before his feet. 
This critique of the intellectual situation in Europe persists until today. In our cultural narrative, natural scientists are typically portrayed as the true scientists. They explore the world's in and outs, but are not concerned with the human condition. What does it, what does it mean to be human, given the complexities of the natural world that surrounds us? Climate change is a case in point. With massive research on the topic, it truly required one Swedish teenager, Greta Thunberg, to connect the science and the human condition in her call to unite behind the science and act upon the science to keep the promise to the future generations. The critique of metaphysicians, those whose studies concerned with matters beyond the immediate physical world, and I take the liberty here to assert that the human sciences covered by the Niels Klim Prize are rooted in metaphysics, is summed up in the notion of ivory tower, expressing the lack of social relevance and perceived uselessness of human sciences. One recipe on how to make social science matter has been offered by a renowned Danish social scientist, Ben Flubery, who suggested to transform social science to an activity that is done in public and for the public. The format of the Holbeck Week, with seminars, lectures, symposia and workshops, is thus a unique opportunity to make social science matter by going publicly and talking about the relevance of what we do and by stimulating interest in human sciences and their timely, yet often neglected, contributions to exploring the human condition. I am enormously grateful for the opportunity given to me as the Niels Klim Prize Laureate to advance the project of the social science that matters. As our societies face global challenges, it has become a common place to say that we need interdisciplinary approaches, but such efforts are rarely celebrated beyond academia. I am excited to be awarded the Niels Klim Prize for my scholarship, I quote, in the intersection between political science, environmental studies and digital humanities, end of quote. A research setting that has no blueprint and has emerged out of the attempt to find ways how human societies can survive and thrive. It is emblematic that this acknowledgement is celebrating Ludwig Holberg a truly interdisciplinary, innovative and artistically talented Nordic scholar. And I wish that more young scholars would not feel constrained by the disciplinary conventions or institutional rules, but rather draw on the richness of interdisciplinarity to solve the issues that lie directly before our feet. I want to extend my gratitude to a number of institutions and individuals who had a profound effect on my development as a scholar leading up to this important moment in my academic career. The Alexander Institute at the University of Helsinki and especially its former director, Professor Marko Kivinen, the Center for Maritime Studies at the University of Turku and its former research director, Professor Ulla Tapaninen, my doctoral thesis advisor, Professor Velipekka Tynkonen, the Environmental Policy Research Group at the University of Helsinki, led by Professor Janne Hukkinen, as well as my opponent, collaborator and most inspiring mentor, Professor Michael Raw from the University of Plymouth. But most of all, I want to thank my parents and my partner, Christoph, for always being there for me through storms and veldrums, navigating my academic ambitions towards the much-desired land of tenure track and beyond to making research that actually matters. Thank you for your love and support. Thank you, and congratulations to you, Daria Gritsenko. We have now witnessed the presentation of the 2020 and the 2021 Holberg Prize and Niels Klim Prize laureates. The Holberg laureates, Professor Grosella Pollock and Professor Marta Nussbaum, are truly remarkable scholars who have made substantial and lasting impact on their respective research fields. Notably, art history for Professor Pollock and philosophy and law for Professor Nussbaum. The Nils Klim laureates, Fredrik Paulsen and Daria Grisenko, have already attained international attention for their research despite their young age. And we wish them the best of luck 
in the future careers, which will undoubtedly be stellar. So I suggest that we extend our sincere congratulations to all four laureates. And now, to perform a congratulatory greeting to the laureates from Brussels, I have the pleasure of giving the floor to Professor Evelyn Krohn, Vice President of the European Research Council, the ERC. Since 2017, Evelyn Krohn has been a member of the ERC Scientific Council. She is Professor in Developmental Neuroscience in Society at Leiden University, the Netherlands. So please, Professor Krohn. Good day to you all. I'm delighted to be part of this event today to honor not one and not two, but four exceptional laureates. 2020 Holberg Laureate Griselda Pollock, 2021 Holberg Laureate Marta Nussbaum, 2020 Niels Klim Laureate Frederik Poulsen, and 2021 Niels Klim Laureate Daria Kritsenko. It is just a shame that we cannot all be together in person on this marvelous occasion. For those that do not know me, I'm a professor in developmental neuroscience in society at the Erasmus University Rotterdam. And since 2017, I have had the honor to serve as a member of the Scientific Council of the European Research Council. And since 2020, as one of its three vice presidents. The European Research Council was first set up in 2007. Its aim is to provide flexible long-term funding to high potential individual researchers. The ERC grantees can be of any nationality and work in any field, including the social sciences and humanities. The aim is to give ERC grantees the freedom to develop ambitious projects of their own choosing. So we fully recognize the value of the social sciences and humanities and the need to support them on an equal basis with the physical and the life sciences. But in these days when funders insist that every research proposal must demonstrate impact or relevance, when politicians and policymakers want to achieve strategic autonomy or to solve grand challenges and missions, then sometimes we have to work that little bit harder to explain the value of social sciences and humanities. I do not doubt that new and improved technologies can make major contributions to addressing some of the many challenges we face. But we also desperately need new ideas about how to live sustainably, how to confront inequality, how we might work and live and educate ourselves in the future. We need to appreciate the wisdom of other societies and cultures and those who have been previously marginalized. We need to learn the lessons of the past as well as the present. And we need more imaginative forms of governance and ethics. We need to understand the causes of fear and anger in our societies as much as the amount of CO2 emissions we make. Only the social sciences and humanities can provide these answers. Indeed, I believe that we in the social sciences and humanities have a special duty to counter a purely instrumental view of knowledge. It is surely no coincidence that those who take this view are also likely to take an instrumental view of our planet and even of ourselves. And this has led us into a cycle of needing more growth and more technologies to solve the problems created by past growth and past technologies. Only the social sciences and humanities can give us a richer, deeper understanding of what it is to be human and the insights to break this cycle. And that is why I am very impressed by the far-sightedness of those who decided to establish these awards, to recognize and celebrate outstanding contributions to research in the humanities, social science, law, or theology. This is a very worthy aim. 
And of course, we have some extremely worthy winners to celebrate. I cannot hope to do justice to their exceptional work in this short introduction. I know that you have had a chance to explore some of it with them this week. But what I can say is that I am truly impressed by the breadth and range of the work carried out by the awardees. From the Arctic to Asaya, and from feminist cinema to a deeper understanding of our capabilities and well being. The achievements and further potential of the Niels Klim Prize winners are there for all to see. And I am in awe of the ability of both the Holberg Prize winners to stay at the cutting edge and sustain such a stream of original, wide ranging, and influential work over so many years. Worthy winners all. Congratulations. Thank you, Professor Kron. Now, last but not least, I yield the floor to the Norwegian Minister of Research and Higher Education, Henrik Asse, who joins us from Oslo. Dear Holberg Prize laureates and Niels Kim Prize laureates, distinguished guests and friends of the Holberg Prize worldwide, on behalf of the Norwegian government, I have the pleasure of congratulating four excellent researchers on the 2020 and 2021 Holberg and Niels Kleem Prizes. You have impressed all of us with your outstanding work in a variety of fields. The pandemic has put a magnifying glass on international challenges. It has effectively shown the significance of knowledge-based public discourse and of international cooperation. Our collective experiences from the pandemic give the Holberg and Niels Klim prizes an extra dimension. Hopefully, we will see the end of the pandemic soon. But before us lie other challenges. In today's world of climate change, large-scale migration and rapid shifts in technology, it is necessary to understand the importance of identity, values, religion, culture, ethics and language. Human activities lie at the bottom of many of our challenges. In order to understand the motives and on which people act, we need to know something about their perceptions of the world. The Holberg and Niels Klim laureates help us do just that. They help us increase our understanding of the world around us. The laureates describe the character of different societies and explore questions fundamental to their development. With your research, you play a key role as guardians of the fundamental values and essential knowledge on which societies are built and developed. Historical timelines, religion, language, art, culture, philosophy. Dear laureates, your work clearly demonstrates the importance of the fields covered by the Holberg and Nils Klim prizes. Each of you has delivered insight that confronts how we view ourselves and our common history. You represent four different disciplines, four different countries and different generations of researchers. In common, you have your devotion to your work, courage and commitment to excellence. An in strict value of the Holberg week is to increase dialogue between different generations of scientists. This combination of experience and a fresh look can lead to great results. The laureates we honor today are role models both for current researchers and for future scientists. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the University of Bergen for administrating the prizes so well and to the Academic Society for supporting the work and hence contributing to the success of the Holberg and Niels Klim prizes. I sincerely hope that we can meet in Bergen next year to celebrate you and to celebrate excellence in science. To the laureates, on behalf of the Norwegian government, my sincerest congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Henrik Asheim. We have now reached the end of the award ceremony for the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize. And I want to thank you all 
for attending this festive event. You who are watching from around the world, as well as the audience here in the University Aula in Bergen. And we will conclude this ceremony with Hova Gimse's second set, where he will perform the following pieces. First, Impromptio Opus 5 by Jean Sibelius, and then Kjempevise Slotten, or Ballad of Revolt in English, from Opus 22 by Heidel Sedrud. Now, enjoy the music, have a nice day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Please.